Well, I have never been a fan of this story. Not at all, in fact, in some, for a while, this was one of, if not my least favourite story of all time, with quite a bit of that time behind the Romans, so second least favourite of all time, and at other points it may have been my least favourite. Um, but now I can say it's not, uh, I wouldn't say it's awful, but I still don't like it. The Monster of Fucking Peladon. <laughs> Hello ladies and gentlemen, Nick here, and welcome to my review of Doctor Who Season 11 Story 4, The Monster of Peladon, John Pertwee's penultimate story as the third Doctor, and the final story to A, featured the Ice Warriors until 2013 on screen, and um, I've already mentioned the two other stories that they were going to appear in before they were cancelled June those seasons not being made, to be honest, one of them being replaced by another one, and one of them due to being the show being cancelled, and then not them basically not appearing until 2013, which is pretty much 39 years after this story. Um, also, I must apologise for noises outside, some people are working on some a neighbour's drive. Um, so I've already mentioned those, and yeah, and considering this is the last Ice Warrior uh, TV story until 2013, it's a pretty weak way for them to go out, and it's also Brian Hales' last story, so he goes out on a uh, not very good note, and it's Peladon's last on-screen appearance, again goes out on a bad note, so yeah, in all honesty, this is a pretty weak way, the only, uh, only, uh, people do don't really go out on a bad note is the third Doctor who's got one more story after this and Sarah Jane as she's only just basically started uh, only a few stories ago so they're okay they don't get bad send-offs these are just bumps in the road but again we got a, pen a penultimate story that isn't very good and just like the smugglers by Brian Hales although I did like the Bri the smugglers well I say that I, I thought it was okay I, I think I gave it a seven I think I might have been a bit too nice on that maybe I should have gone giving it a six um, maybe I should have done that, but, um, maybe I'll have to redo that one, but, uh, that was probably, that was certainly a weaker one of season four, and William Hartnell's penultimate story, and that was pretty weak, considering it was his penultimate story, as a normal episode, it wouldn't have been too bad, uh, but it was also the season opener. Uh, Toy Maker was apparently not very, uh, it was pretty much taken from him and made into something a bit different. But unlike Nightmare and Silver, it actually turned out good, as opposed to not very good. And I think Neil Gaiman should have gotten uh, more creative rights on that, on Nightmare and Silver. And then we get to the Ice Warrior stories, whilst Seeds of Death were, was great, and I'm interested about that R Warriors of the Red Planet stuff. Curse of Peladon was also pretty good but not amazing, but the Ice Warriors was awful. And I would have given that a 4 out of 10, as I previously mentioned, if it wasn't for the animation. The animation on the re on the 2013 release was amazing. That's what was causing the problem. Anyway, so the 2013 animation was great, but the story still sucked. And that's what I still, uh, I pretty much think on, of the Macro Terror that's been released. I, PSI just... Uh, uh, watched uh, watched it for the first time. I'll be doing a review of that on the Hooniversals at a later date. I'll check out the colour version first. But black and white version, look, the animation looks great, but the story still sucks. Um, but that's the Macro Terror. That'll be a re-review coming soon to a channel near you. Uh, but for this channel, today we're looking at Brian Hales' last Doctor Who story, and, the, and it's it's not very good. He goes on. He goes out on a whimper. It's almost as bad as the, 
uh, no, worse than the Ice Warriors in some places and almost as bad in other places. I will say this, like the Space Pirates on my first viewing of that story, um, on the latest viewing of this one, I thought the second half did get better. Um, although, like I said, on in the Space Pirates review, I did do the re-review, sorry, the re-watch, the whole story just fell flat. So thankfully this doesn't fall into the same trap. On re-review, re-watches, the second half is better. It did help, probably, that I did watch it in two days as I am watched part of the first three episodes on the Monday. Uh, it's Wednesday the 24th of April at time of recording. I did watch half of it on Monday 22nd, Easter Monday, but there wasn't enough time to watch the whole story. So I watched the other half on Tuesday 24th. And I honestly think the gap in between days helped with my experience of this because most of my problems are in the first three episodes of the stories. I have, that's where most of my distaste of the story comes from. The problem I have is that the story doesn't, I don't, I'm not interested in the story. The miners uh, go on a revolt. It's, a, it's, provo it's taking inspiration from the miners strike of 1973, four, five. Um, so not quite as uh, famous as the eighties ones, but pr uh, pretty well known, I suppose. So it's taking inspiration from that, but that's, it's not really done effectively. Plus I don't know how violent those miners were. Uh, in this story, we've got a miner who's trying to make peace, but a miner, but another one tries leading them via a violent route, and he also starts going a bit mad throughout the story until his death at the end of part five. There's also a really dick Chancellor, Chancellor Autumn, the one I've been warning you about since forever. Um, on rewatch, in the first three episodes, he is a massive. Cunt. No, no sugar coat coating it. He is a cunt. I mean, he's not as bad as I used to think he was in this rewatch, but he's still irredeemable until part four. Somehow he has a complete change of character throughout part four, part five. And he actually starts, he sides with the doctor, uh, even after three episodes of thinking, oh, he's an alien spy, traitor. Ah! Stuff like that, and then suddenly he's now on the Doctor's side because the Ice Warriors have taken over, I guess. Hang on a second. I'll stomach the heat. Uh, the warmth. But yeah, uh, Chancellor Rorton, he's in the first three episodes, he's just a cunt. Basically, he's... Yeah, he's, so as, as well as the stuff with the Doctor, he's also... You know, in the I, in the arc, I mentioned that this there was this one guy who overheard the Doctor talking to Stephen at one point about how they accidentally brought the disease on board and then he runs up and cries, Did you hear them? They admitted to bring the disease on board! They have condemned us! Take them away, they're monsters! Ah! So that, basically that guy. Well, Orton does a pretty much similar thing in this story, although not screaming and shouting it to everybody. He's like, Ah, so you want to invo uh, contact your rebel friend Gibbeck? I do like some of the way the Doctor and Sarah have a go at him at some points, but it's not often, it's only once or twice every now and again. It's not often. I would have liked one of them to actually say, Shut up, Horton! In fact, Sarah even shouts, Pompous idiot! I think at one point, but I don't think Orton hears her, and the Doctor does go to her just afterwards, like he's trying to stop her from going any further. He does that! The third Doctor stops his companion, well, third and second, I should say. The Doctor seems to, doesn't want his companions um, saying stuff like that, even though he is pretty much fine with doing it himself. For some reason, the second Doctor would try and stop Jamie from going too far with his, some, uh, him getting a bit annoyed in some places. So, I don't know, if this was William Hartnell, he would not be tolerating any of this. In fact, John Pearl is not really tolerating much of it anyway. Um, yeah, and the, just locking the Doctor up in a prison cell in part for it's just pointless. I don't even see the point of having Autumn made to look like an antagonist. I can see him being a prick because he's a wealthy, aristocratical character, but the fact that he's being made to look like a baddie in this story, considering he's not really the villain of the story, but he's being kind of a partly look, looking like this. I just can't stand him. I just, ah, oh, every time he's on fucking screen in parts one to three, apart from earlier on when he's okay, he's actually okay to start with. 
But it's around when the Doctor comes along, that's when he starts being a dick. And then in part four, he changes sides as soon as the Ice Warriors appear. There's even part two ends on him trying to send the Doctor and Sarah down to be killed by Agador, who thankfully s spares them. P.S. I must mention, Agador pops up at the end of part two, starts part three, and then the Doctor uses him as a tracker in part six, and he kills the real villain of that story, but the villain also kills Agador. And so this is basically Agador's last story, and they have, I suppose, the way to wrap up the story, the Agador 2, uh, two-ology, I suppose, was, the Pedal and Agador 2-ology, was to have Agador killed. First of all, it didn't feel justified killing off Agador for not really having much to do in this story, and in the last story he didn't even have that much to do. Not really. He's a he's a great character, but he didn't have that much to do in these two stories. It's a shame. He had some... He did do some great stuff, but him being killed off just doesn't quite work. It's not justified. I think if they were going to... I think if they had been hoping to do a third story with Tom Baker, then he probably would have been okay dying in that story had he had more to do, of course. But he doesn't really get much to do here and therefore his death doesn't feel justified. Also, I am pissed that Agador, Agador died because he is a character I like, even despite not having much screen time. Especially in this story. Come on, you've got the spirit of Agador, but you don't use Agador more than twice in the story? Good grief. I will say this, the twist works. In a way, the twist of the villains do work, with the Ice Warriors turning out to be the villains, and then Ecclesy, although about... Part, I think it's in part 5 it's revealed, although you could have a guess around part 4-ish a little bit. You could have a little, you could probably guess it. I mean, first viewing it might be a bit of a shock, but you could probably guess. And the Ice Warriors are, this band of Ice Warriors are a breakaway group. A bit like those Sanchi from the Death of the Doctor, the Sarah Jane Adventure story. They're a breakaway group who follow a different path and don't do the same way. And in this case, these want they want to return to the glorious days of blood and violence in Martian case. Um, not quite the honour or the Martian honour, etc. that we now know the Martian law to be um, today. And like, again, I think that was probably from Lords of the Red Planet. And again, Brian, it's a, it's a shame he never adapted any of that Ice Warrior honour stuff uh, honour and law stuff into any of his stories. It would have been nice maybe for a mention or two in Seeds or Curse or this story. I mean, Ice Warriors, I could probably see uh, that'd be okay not really having it, despite them be just basically being uh, typical villainous monsters in that story, but uh, with the whole honour idea coming on along later, it could be forgiven, but why the whole Ice Warrior law stuff isn't touched on again until expanded media and then later in the new series it, it I don't know I don't know Brian Hales created the characters why doesn't he include some of this stuff that he had in a story that didn't get made why doesn't he have incorporate some of it into his stories that did, did get made I don't understand why aren't the Ice Warriors in these stories like the ones that we know today and but I am okay with the breakaway group being the villains and it makes sense sense in a way although it does kind of make the ice warriors being the the a allies in curse of peladon look a little pointless because we've had two stories with the ice warriors as the main villains no redemption no breakaway group just them being the villains full out then we get a story of them being the allies and now we have a breakaway group trying to go back to the villainy uh, but the Ice Warriors themselves are allies-ish still, at least the real ones. So, it does kind of make uh, Curse of Peladon a bit pointless in that case. At least them being allies in that story makes it a little bit pointless. But then again, I guess that's ba it's basically the, the Hellbent to Heaven Sent. Hellbent basically making Heaven Sent pretty much unnecessary. Which is a shame because Heaven Sent was a million times better than Hellbent. Trust me. And you know what? 
This is half as good as the Curse of Peladon, I will, I will say. This is not as good. Curse of Peladon is twice as good as this. And if I was exaggerating, then I'd probably just say about 50%. Uh, well, no, it's double. Uh, 200. Uh, whatever, Dun numbers don't count. But, um, yet, we'll get to the score later. I will say the Doctor does have some great moments. John Pertwee does a great penultimate uh, performance, as does Elizabeth Slane. She does a good stop job as Sarah Jane. Uh, for the bits where they're friends, the pits, yeah, looks very fake. Uh, they have some good stuff. The woman who plays the Queen, who we see on the cover, she does good. She does sound very soft and quite spoken to begin with, but she does uh, raise her voice a few more times, especially when talking to Autumn in part three. And she does have some good moments to do. I think she is a little bit of a weaker character to start with, but she grows a little bit more. Not an incredible amount. Um, I would say about the same amount as the King from Curse. But certainly there is more per, uh, growth later on, just not a huge amount. And I would say Gibbick is also a pretty good character, whilst uh, the miner who goes a bit mad. I would say I can understand his points in the first half of the story. But in the second half of the story, he does go a bit insane, and it's, just, it's getting a bit old, old, old. And you know, the story is kind of getting a bit confused on what story it wants to tell for the first half. Where does it want to follow the Minor Strike story? Does it want to follow the, the Federation trying to get this mineral? Is it trying to follow the story of the people in the palace? It's getting a bit. It's a bit confused with itself. And the second half kind of fixes that a little bit. It kind of works a bit more as one, but it's just like the first half of the story just doesn't seem to be able to make its mind up to begin with. Um, and yeah, I just, I just didn't really enjoy it and I got really, I got very annoyed throughout the first half of the story with Auton's attitude towards the Doctor and Gibbick. Basically, he wouldn't, he does not listen to any, anything that would say, you're wrong. If you tell him that, he's probably like, oh, I don't care, or something. But he doesn't say that. He's just a big prick. He, he basically wants his own way, I suppose. <sighs> I actually cheered when he died. I didn't cheer as much as... Um, I don't remember who I cheered for when they died, but in a, char a character I absolutely dis disliked, I cheered when they died in a previous story. I can't remember what... what character it was but they they, they deserved it um to one that was bugging me for one who was annoying me for a while was it Cutler from Tenth Plans I don't think so it was a character uh, but here I also cheered and even though Chancellor Auton did get better in parts 4 and 5 he's still a massive prick I will say that I am glad to see Alpha Centuri and Yasmin Churchman is back in the story as the voice, I do like how there are some funny moments from uh, them, and they are a bit more involved in the story and have some good chemistry with the, with the Doctor and Sarah and Eccleston, um, and prove to be more important as an ally. They're not just standing in a corner saying that they don't like violence anymore. This time they actually get involved a little bit, not so much with the violence stuff, but certainly with other stuff going along. Um, so so plot-wise, uh, Alpha Centauri gets a bit more to do, thank goodness. And Eccleseed's a pretty good villain. He, although his motivation is money and ruling planet Earth, yeah, basic villain. Twist comes pretty well. It's a pretty well t good to twist, but you could predict it, especially where the Ice Warriors are hiding. And you could pretty much predict that it's the Ice Warriors in the refinery early on before the twist. Um, so, in fact, the twist, sorry, not the cliff twist, the cliffhanger, in fact, the cliffhanger is the Doctor, the Ice Warriors coming out of the refinery, so, yeah, and then the Doctor tells Sarah, those creatures you saw in the refinery, go and have a look at one of them. So either he's telling Sarah, basically telling Sarah Jane in his special way that it was the Ice Warriors in there, or he's figured it out and he's trying to get Sarah to figure it out as well. <sighs> I don't know, I just, I don't really care for this one anymore. I just, I got, I get, I was starting to get fed up before the end of the first episode. And that is not a good sign, not even for long stories where you've got not very interesting first parts. I mean, sometimes you could lose focus or interest around part one, but it would usually pick up again later on. But I just, 
really uncomfortable and really agitated throughout the next two parts. Three, uh, four, five, and six, I wasn't so bad with. Uh, I, I just didn't really care anymore uh, by the end. I just, I don't care. I, just, I mean, it's a little bit more fun than the last couple of times, apart from the last time where for some reason it, like Dragonfire, went very, uh, closer to sevens for some reason. But times before that, it was pretty low, and I put my default ratings pretty low as well on the when I was listing up my rankings, so they'd be ready to be changed or saying the same when we get to the actual rewatches. And yeah, and my default was five, and then I lowered it to three before rewatching. But uh, after this uh, rewatch, I'm going to go halfway between those two numbers and give it a four. So in the end, the Monster of Peladon has a couple of good moments. It's got some decent bits, uh, some fun stuff. Alpha Centuri gets more to do in terms of the plot. John Pertwee and Elizabeth Lane did great performances as a supporter cast. I even think, uh, whilst Chancellor Autumn is a dick of, dick of a character, the actor is having such a great time playing him, even when he's supposed to be look, looking cross or angry. But whenever he's... He does look like he's having fun, especially in some of the bits where Autumn is getting his own way and trying to arrest or condemn the Doctor or Gebek or Sarah or someone. But uh, overall... Um, it's not that great. It's uh, the it's, the twist is okay. Uh, it's, it's good. It's executed well, but it can be predicted. You can see it's a mile off. Um, it doesn't know what it wants to be to start with, and then it just becomes something very different later on. Yeah, that it the first, the latter half does come become a bit different to what we've had before. But maybe that's for the best. But it's still a bit of a mess of a story. Um, it, it's not awful like I used to think it was. But it's not going to be uh, as good as uh, the other Ice Warriors stories, besides Ice Warriors, which I think would be around the same level if it wasn't for that amazing animation for the new DVD release. If I thought if I'd seen the original, the actual episodes themselves, or a reconstruction, then I'd probably have given that a four, as I've previously mentioned, and it'd be about the same level, if not maybe even worse. Um, in fact, maybe in fact it probably would be worse, but. With the animation, it can't be. But, anyway, so Monster of Peladon, I'm going to give it a 4 out of 10. So yeah, that's basically uh, my score, and that's basically what I think of this story now. I do not despise it like I used to do, but I still dread the idea of watching the story. I still find it excruciating to watch, and I do find it less enjoyable, at least the first half. Um, it gets a bit better later on, but I don't know, it just doesn't really work that well. Also, they tried to fake us out on thinking the Doctor's dead at least twice in the second half. Yet we all know he's going to regenerate in the next story. Even viewers of this, this story at this time would know he's still got one more story left. And that's going to be his final story. So please don't fake out. I mean, if it was just a normal... If this wasn't the final season... Heck, if this was, ev was even the penultimate story, it would work. It wouldn't work, but it wouldn't be as annoying... Or silly, and twice, twice. It's like in in the Daemons when there is the fake out of the uh, the Doctor is supposed may have died. That one wouldn't have been. That wasn't wasn't as bad, um, because it wasn't the penultimate story of the season, nor was it the Doctor's penultimate season. It was uh, that sorry penultimate story. It was the final story of his second season out of five. So it wasn't too bad. But yeah, having two fake outs in the penultimate story of the penultimate of the final season doesn't quite work. And it's not like Case of Androzani where he's regenerating here, he's regenerating in the final story. But uh Case of Androzani and the Tenth Planet are two exceptions to the rule of a doctor regenerating at the end of a season or the very start of a season or in a special. So there you go. So yeah, that's next story, by the way. Speaking of which, next time we'll be looking at John Pertwee's final story, Planet of the Spiders, the final story of season uh, 11. I was about to say 5 for some reason. It's story 5. 
of season 11. It's going to see the last appearance of Mike Yates, excluding uh, the Five Doctors and Dimensions of Ta in Time, and it's going to redeem his character for that. It will be the last story with Benton as a sergeant before he's promoted in Robot. And it's going to be the last story we see a short-haired Sarah Jane Smith. She's going to have longer hair uh, in Robot. And then it'll get longer as time goes on. In fact, she's starting to get a bit longer here. And it's also one or it's going to be that the story with the giant spiders. Not Arachnids in the UK, the other one. The other story with the giant spiders and another story connecting this blue crystal. There's a lot of connections with this story in the previous season uh, with Metabelis 3, the crystal, etc. So I'm at, and Unit's back, and Bessie's back, and the Humabil's back. So yeah, but there's also going to be some shit uh, visual effects at some point. But more on that next time. But yeah, next time, Planet of the Spiders. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. <laughs>